All right, rock and roll. Great to have you on the show. Dr. Dirk Bauer happens to be a friend, happens to be the CTO of Soji. Um, we've got a lot to cover in terms of the future of where the world is headed in terms of blockchain, why you're uniquely qualified to talk about that. But before we do, um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your earlier life, where you grew up, um, and how you got into technology uh, in, in the first place. And from what I've learned about you, you are decades ahead of trends before they happen. So I think it, it's a very auspicious time that we're, we're meeting right now. But yeah, we'd love to hear a little bit about um, how you grew up and how you got into tech. Yeah, I mean, I was born in Germany. That's probably you can hear from my accent. And I study economic information technology and I have been living here in Thailand since 2005. I'm married, have two older sons in the age of 14 and 17. And I love to travel, especially with a motorbike. So this, this riding with a motorcycle helps me to, to get out of every day's work, getting new ideas. And it's a totally open from my tech life that I have done for, for the last uh, 30 years. Um, I joined in 1990 a tech company and we developing client server technology. So we, we remove this big mainframe. So you probably can remember this big computers uh, filling up complete rooms and yeah, we remove them and we, we coming back to the small PCs, desktop size computers and uh, small servers. Um, yeah, this was uh, the big buzzwords in 1919, client server technology. And then it starts in internet. I mean, we start internet, we, we're building websites, we're building e-commerce on the internet. Um, all these things are start moving. And as I coming to in 2005 to, to Thailand, I was probably the first digital nomad here. As I worked for, for a German American company remotely for them. Um, yeah, I, I worked out of Thailand and we had so many problems. We, the Wi-Fi was extremely unstable. We used most of the time GPIS and Edge. And I mean, I think even 3G was not born at this time. So it was a very, uh, yeah, funny time that we had here to, to creating something like this. And to fast forward a little bit here in, in 2016, I took over an international IT team here in Thailand, building smart home applications. And in 2018, I moved pro probably in, into the blockchain space. So to finding the way how to use blockchain on an economical base, a little bit away from, from the things like, like Bitcoin and altcoin tradings, more to the real use case of the value of blockchain, that blockchain really makes a difference in our future life, same as the internet, let's say 20 years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what, what compelled you? What was interesting to you? What did you see early in blockchain 2018? Um, and tell us a little bit about the work that you were doing then. How did you know it was going to be something? Yeah, I mean, very early in, in 2013, I got my first Bitcoin transfer and uh, I sold the Bitcoins directly. So I'm a little bit uh, worried about this today because Bitcoin has a different price in these days. But what I see in, in blockchain is that we have an underlying technology. Um, it is like a database, but it's decentralized and it's immutable. You cannot change the data. It is absolutely secure. You cannot touch it and it can solve so many problems. I mean, if you own, let's say a company and you own your own database, you can change the data. Nobody can do something against it. In a blockchain, it's public. You cannot change. It is there and they forever. And this gives us so many options to develop new use cases and, and bringing things out of the old world to the digital world. And especially the, the NFTs is thing that was really missing. I mean, if you're looking a little bit to, to an NFT, it is an very exceptional version of a token because it is not like, like, let's say you have a normal Bitcoin. I can replace your Bitcoin with my Bitcoin. This is still a Bitcoin. It has the same value, but this is not the case for an NFT. An NFT is um, unique. It's a non-fungible token. And this allows us to 
create digital sets that can be collected. So we could be getting back that we don't had for, let's say, a decade or two, where we can collect things and own things that are rare and re really unique. And, and, and just you know, uh, to, to further elaborate or dig in, why is that so important right now? Why are NFTs so important? And where is it headed? There are two different things why it's so important. The first thing is uh, it gives artists an option to create art, like audio art, and to sell it. And there is ways to monetize for an art that we don't had in the old days before. Let's say if you bought 20 years ago a music CD, let's say for $10, and you sell it today to your friend for $100, the artist gets nothing from this transaction. If you have an NFT, the artist could get still a royalty fee from it. And this makes a difference. If you if if you can see this way to, to monetize in the future, to really participating on the price and, and the price growing of an art, and that is still getting something, then we have a totally different way as we had it before. The other thing is we can have many layers in an NFT. You have the audio, you have the visual layer, like an artwork, like an album cover, but you also can take a physical product on it. You could print a model from, from the singer and 3D and take this to, to the artwork, to the NFT. So we, the, the artist can, can create new ways of distributing and um, creating new products, not only the sound, not only the audio. Are NFTs limited? Afford, I'm just I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. Let's say I have, um, let's say I paint a picture and uh, I figure it is a piece of art and I put it on an NFT. Um, and can I take like a, a picture I painted physically and make an NFT about it? Because it sounded a little bit like that. And and what does that mean to have an NFT with a picture? It's proof uh, that this picture is not a copy. That this is already. Let's say, I mean, we, we all know where the Mona Lisa is. So, but if we make a digital copy and you own the NFT, you are the real owner. And this is the proof of it. You have a collectible here. Um, even if everybody can see it, even if everybody has millions of reprints and in every living room, you have a print of the Mona Lisa, but you can prove that you still have the original. You are the owner. And, and um, so, for, for what, what are the cases that that would be interesting to me? I mean, you mentioned, uh, let's say, royalties or probably copyrights claims or things like that. Is that correct? I mean, because let's say Mona Lisa was printed 100,000 times and is in all kinds of living rooms and the original is in the Louvre, but still people go to the original, right? So why do they do that? I mean, it's like, it's a little bit strange uh, about human psychology and uh, so the, uh, I, because th this NFT thing seems to be even more removed from, um, let's say, some kind of physical reality where I can basically have the exact same copy on my own computer if I'm part of the blockchain, correct? I, I actually have it on my computer. It's just not mine in some, because I yes. don't have, yeah. But look, I mean, from, from uh, old, old days ago, we are hunters and collectors. And... So over the last 20 years, you cannot own something. The society was shifting to a way of a subscription model. Nobody buy in these days any CDs. We're going out and buy, pay for Spotify and, and listen to the music. We not own it anymore. But an NFT give us this back. We can own it. We can own it very rare models, very, very uh, limited editions. And this is something what is not really possible uh, over the last 20 years in the digital world. But with an NFT, we're getting this, op getting this options now on the digital world. Okay, then this I really get. That's a, yeah. Like, in my, like in, when I was younger, I collected CDs, right? And then when yeah. basically 
I, I also, I, it was very obvious to me that eventually you wouldn't actually own a CD, you would just have a right to listen to certain music, um, which is kind of like you don't own it. And, and there is something about having a collection of CDs or vinyls that is very nice, right? So, so basically, if I understand it correctly, I'll be able to have a collection of, you know, art or songs or whatever it is for me. And I will actually own it. Okay, I, I think that's great. It's it's requires a, a shift in thinking a little bit. Yeah, you 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 own the the rights to listen to it. You you not own the rights to copy it. You not own the rights to. Yes. Uh, you are not the, the creator of it, but you have the rights to listen to it. And this doesn't depends on if you're paying a subscription model or not. And how and this is makes a real difference for. And, and then on the NFT, uh, let's say I would copy it, right? And I don't have the right as somebody, because you say it, it's also public, right? Can everybody see it and copy it? And then how can can the person know that it was copied? Or like, is there anything there are, like- There are different, yeah. different blockchain models. One model is a an, an private network, so it would be not really visible to the public, so not not everybody could could be copy it or listen to it. Uh, another way would be it would be uh, public. Everybody can listen to it. Everybody can make a copy from it like this, but you are still the owner. Others just have a copy, but you have the original artwork. You have the original cover in your hands. This is. You, you have it on your on your phone in your digital wallet and this is where you're collecting your, your future stuff and let's say for music because i know i have noticed and i'm sure many people have um, that in for instance uh, spotify or other streaming services if you don't have access to uh, also on apple music if you don't have the song you can still often listen to like a little bit of it right would there be a possibility for a combination where parts is in a public, parts in a private, or anything like that? Yes, yeah, sure. This is possible. Everything could be, be uh, I mentioned before. I mean, especially for the commercial part for, for the artist. If you, if you would sell your NFT, the artist could still uh, participate on, on the sales price. And whatever the sales price is, the sales price could be going up. Uh, if it's a very rare piece of art, uh, you might be selling it for 10 times, 20 times what you bought for it. The artist would participate with a percentage on it. Wow. So let's say I have a piece of art um, or, or a, a, an artist that I know has a piece of art and he puts it on a, on a blockchain and I buy it for $100 from him. And then he can write in the contract in the NFT that if I sell it uh, at a price X, then he gets 20% or something like that. Is that, that how it works? Or? Yeah, what, how, how often, every time if you, if you, if you uh, sell it, you would participate on, on the test price. Fascinating. Uh, yes, this is something that was not, not possible to do it in, in, in the days before. So it, as I say, there, there are so much more ways for artists to, to, to be creative, to finding ways to monetizing th their work. They could be even coming together with, with, with designers for creating covers and joining together, say, okay, 3% of, of the royalties goes to the cover designer, for example. These are things that was not not really possible before, so, but this is no. Uh, these things are working with the blockchain, and everything is is traceable. So it is not somewhere on a company's computer, and we cannot see it, and we just get a report, and we have to believe it. On an NFT on blockchain, it is it is visible. We can see every transaction. We we can see who owned it before. And nobody can manipulate data. In terms of the payments, so back in the day, or maybe still right now, artists, you know, let's say that they had a successful album, they get paid by the producer, they get checks once a month or every two weeks or whenever they get these checks, right? And that space, or maybe it goes into their bank account. 
Um, we have a certain uh, relationship with the payments and then getting it into the bank account. Does NFT solve the money in the bank account without you needing to manage something? Is there something around that technology as well? Sure. Um, as you sell NFT on the blockchain, you would uh, exchange it against, let's say, stable coins like in US dollar coin. Um, and you can just on off ramp it on, on fiat, it means you can transfer it to your bank account or wherever you need the money. Um, everything is, is covered on, on this level. Uh, you just have it in your wallet, you, you create your artwork, it's, it's in your wallet, then you sell the artwork the US dollars in your wallet, and then you just decide where you want it. And this goes immediately. So you're not losing time. So I create something, uh, I sell it as an artist, as a creator, uh, someone buys it for as an NFT, I open uh, my phone, and I see how many times people have listened to it, I see how much money has gone into my account from it. I, in other words, it's sort of like a passive, you create something, it's leveraged, but then it's just like all managed digitally. Is that one of the advantages to creators uh, moving forward, where some of the, the finer details that artists might not even want to deal with are handed, are, are dealt with and managed automatically? Of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because it's remove all the problems from the artist to, to creating contracts, to, to reading contracts, to, to joining uh, societies, uh, to getting royalties, uh, all these things are removed because you just create it on an NFT and you sell it, you get your royalties and you can bundle it, you can make special versions, you, you can selling concert tickets, you, you can even after the concert say, okay, the recording of the concert goes to every concert hall, ticket holder so in your concert ticket NFT, you have also the recordings from, from, from the concert. There are so many options that we not had in, in the old days that's coming here and are possible now. Would you, would you call it like the golden age of creators, the golden age of artists because of this technology, because of the infrastructure, that it's a way of really empowering artists and creators like never has been possible before in history? Yes. Yes, that's of course the case. I mean, we, we saw this already with YouTube uh, many years ago as the creators coming in a position to making money, to, to, to getting a, a, a share from Google for, for the YouTube adverts uh, and, and all these things. And we see that many people are making a lot of in especially on, on video. And I think the NFT will be the part who enables audio to do it. Um, from a technology point of view, the NFTs works better with audio as with videos because the space in an NFT is limited. You have no problems to get an uh, useless audio format in, but let's say a 4K video for one hour would be a problem of space, just pure space problems. So, and this is why I see that especially the audio will be the real benefit for the NFTs. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit, the distinction between audio and video for NFTs? It is just that, that you have a token and in this token, you have a limited space to store data. And this limitation probably fits better to, to, to the audio because let's say you're having 30 megabytes, you're getting any kind of audio into 30 megabytes, but you would probably only get maybe one minute video in. And this is kind of a different why I think, uh, especially for audio is the NFT, it's the perfect vehicle for the future for creators to getting and, and, and uh, creating something like this. And it's also so we getting in a more close contact to the artist. If you're owning the NFT, you have a relation to the artist. You, you can show him, look, I have the NFT. If you met him on the street, or you have so many new things that you can do in, in getting in touch and, and building the audience and the creators, the, the artist can, can uh, reach into the audience directly. Uh, there are so many more ways to do things um, that was not really uh, the way uh, in this, let's say, old world, how you can, can address your, your real fans.
it's complicated. But now you can address, you know who, who has uh, NFTs, you can address them. Brilliant. So, David. <clears throat> I just find fascinating that uh, it seems to be the case that we more and more uh, focus on um, knowledge work and creative work as humans, right? So we first yes. machines replace the, the heavy handiwork and now more and more other types of repetitive works. And one thing that doesn't seem to be too impressively done by AI is a creative, uh, a, yeah, creative work basically. And what you're describing to me sounds like a future is possible where we can basically do creative work and we can attribute and get compensated for the value we add basically indefinitely. I mean, now a lot of, um, our legal system and and, uh, and and laws deal with copyrights, patents. Uh, there are a lot of jobs in that. And it sounds like maybe there might be a, a solution coming where many of, of those things will be less necessary, you know, having those outer controls where it can be more direct. Is that fair? Yes, fair of course. Or do I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, especially on, on the last side, it is much easier for the artist to, to control this and uh, to getting fair compensated. It is, uh, and the stats are just much more um, correct. If, if I'm thinking uh, how, how in, in these days, uh, like, like a gamer would counting uh, for the artist, it's kind of a grayscale, especially for smaller artists. So, yeah, we have exact data. Nobody can manipulate this. We have the exact numbers, how often it's got played, how long it's got played. We have all this information and we don't need to uh, doing some statistics work over it and say, okay, uh, we've this 500 times in the radio, so it should be on average, something like this. And so no, exactly. And this is a big benefit here and will probably also reduce the, the law cases that I have with. Uh, record labels and, and other companies. I want to come back to the NFT and the blockchain um, and also your predictions are on where it's headed. Um, going back, I'm curious in your perspective, uh, you were, let's say, one of the first digital nomads 2005. 2005, in many ways, uh, even though it's only, you know, I don't know, 16 years ago, it's ancient history because it's like really before YouTube, it's before Facebook took off, you know, so not to mention Instagram and Twitter and um, Snapchat, et cetera, TikTok. What was uh, your experience of uh, early adopter of the internet in 2005 versus right now at an early stage of, of the emergence of blockchain? H how do you see those differences being an early adopter, being a visionary? The differences is probably in the way that everything goes much faster. But I, but I really saw over the last years, over all this invention that's coming, it's going so much faster. If it took us in 2005, probably two years, three years, I think in 2007, we got the first iPhone, the first tool that was really helpful for the digital nomads. Uh, it took two years until it comes up. In these days, this technology growing so fast, everything is available in a, in a good speed, in a good quality. Um, the changes on the society coming much, much faster in much shorter time. And this will affect uh, all of us. But it gives us new, new, new ways to, to create and new ways to make business. And I think this is, for me, a, a very important thing that this is not bad, this is good. Everything moving forward is good, we change and we getting things in a way that was not possible before. And we need to be creative on this. Just coming back to one example, as I say, if you are an artist and you know who is the holders of your NFTs, of course, you don't have a phone number, you don't have an address, you don't have an email, you don't can send them something over. But what you can do is, let's say you, you make a music, just grab 20 seconds or 30 seconds 
and creates this in a new token of your new song. You put this in a token and airdrop this to everybody who has already an NFT from you. This is how you can promote your new work to your fans. You reach them directly. You don't reach other people, just them. Just airdrop it. It's easy. It gives us new, new possibilities in, in marketing for agencies, but also for the artists direct. We just need to, to find the ways to, to adapt to this new world. How do NFTs uh, empower marketing agencies? Direct contact to, to, to the fans, to, to the audience. You, you can directly access them. You don't need to, to make all this uh, target thinking and say, okay, this is my target group and this and age group and you know how it all works. And here you know your audience. You just can address them on a, on a fingertip. Meaning the people who engage with an NFT, uh, that data is right there available so that a marketing agency can just engage with that audience directly. You don't need to know all uh, the current way of like, well, you want to unpack a little bit about, the, let's say, how you'd see the difference between uh, old school targeting, whether that's Google ads or Facebook ads and all the data that Facebook provides, Google provides versus the marketing agency of, let's say, the 2020s, 2030s. Uh, leveraging the NFTs? I think one of the ways is the blockchain will never forget. So the blockchain store your wallet address and the blockchain knows that you owned somewhere on the fly this NFT. But probably you was interested in this artist. And if I'm as a marketing agency, I want to get in touch with everybody who likes this artist or every time own something from this artist. I can just get all the wallet addresses and I can airdrop, as I say, a new token with, let's say, 20 second uh, teaser of the work and give you an option to buy the artwork. I can directly address the real customers. I don't need to, to target and uh, thinking age groups and in countries and so this goes exactly down to the point and what what what, what how do you see um well here david and i were building soji working on soji we uh we met a lot of incredibly brilliant talented ctos um there's a few things that stood out uh far and above uh from your end uh when speaking with you um what did what attracted you to the potential? Um, what attracted you to the potential of Soji? What what was attractive to you um, in terms of the vision of where of where Soji is headed and how that fits into the the world of blockchain and NFT? So many things. I I really like the concept. This this use cases out of Soji are. Incredible, they, they are endless. We have so many options on developing the product, on, on developing nuances of the product. Like, let's say you are a YouTuber and you, you need background music. Sochi could be the place to go. You buy an NFT, you have your background music. Just buy the NFT with the correct copyrights for it and you have it in, in your YouTube. As, as one example, um, you want to be in touch with your artist. You want not only listen to the music, you, you want to support the artist. You want to own something from the artist. Maybe an own greeting uh, on an audio greeting from, from the artist or just a special record uh, that you never had before. It was probably on a live gig or so. All these things is possible to, to get uh, over a concept like uh, Zochi has. And this gives... This changed the world of, of music, in, in, my, in my view. It's really changed the world of music to change also how we communicate. If we're thinking about the, the chat in Suchi, we have so many options here to, to interact with each other. And it makes our life so much easier. I'm a big fan of um, communication. You need to go on a conference call. You need to have time. Time. We have to coordinate. It takes a lot of time to bring it up. 
I like emails a lot. I send just an email. You can answer whenever you have time. So, and in Ansochi, we have this too. I don't need to write. I don't need to have a keyboard. I mean, I'm was a very uh, big fan of BlackBerry phones. I love the keyboard on the BlackBerry phones. And in these days, I still think uh, writing on a touchscreen is a little bit, um, yeah, not so pleasant as on, on the BlackBerry on the old days. And now I can record. I can record. I can send you a message. You can answer. We have the other um, communication. And we have a fun way out of it. We have all these optional functions to creating things. And then I see the way how we can code in future. I mean, I, I see the complete possibilities of USB-C. USB-C will change the world. It is, it is on the way to change the world. I mean, the, the new iPads are delivered with USB-C. You just plug in whatever you have on device. You can plug in audio devices. You can plug in your, your guitar direct with an amplifier in the middle. You can do so many things. And your smartphone or your tablet in these days is so powerful. If I think what was my computer <laughs> in 2005, your smartphone can do so much more in these days. We, we can really make. and with the standards like USB-C, we have the options to do this. And this is like we open a complete new world. And this is what I see in Suchi. We really open a complete new world with bringing the, and the artists together, also in the communication. Very exciting. Um, yeah, I feel like we look, we got to meet you. Uh, and, and, and get you involved and uh, even speaking about the NFTs, I think David and I were, you know, we had a vision for NFTs, uh, understanding it, but your level of expertise um, and, and history of using it is, is a needle mover uh, in terms of where Soji's headed and, you know, we're talking uh, weeks and months away. Um, a curious also um, about your previous work experience. You want to tell us a little bit about the work that you did uh, with the company Pipeline? Um, and, and what you learned uh, as an entrepreneur, as a CTO with that company? Sure. Um, we started the, the company in 2019 um, out of an existing problem on the trading side of um, cryptocurrencies. I mean, if you're a little bit familiar to trading in a, in a yeah, banking world, you have a trading account and Probably you, you can trade wherever you want to trade on this world. Uh, you don't need to care if the money is uh, in Chicago, if the money is in Germany and you want to trade in Chicago, you are good to trade. If you have a trading account, it works. This is not the case with blockchain. If you want to trade Bitcoin, you need to move the Bitcoins to the place where you want to trade. And a transfer could take 30 minutes, maybe one hour, maybe 10 minutes, but you might losing some opportunities. And at the same time, you're transferring your Bitcoins to a crypto exchange. And in this time, um, your funds are on risk. If the exchange get hacked and something like this comes kind of often, no, you might losing your Bitcoins. In the last years, we had many hacks, but the exchanges always compensate the owners, so there is not really a loss uh, from a consumer side, but we will never know what is in future. So we're bringing Bitcoins on, a, on an exchange and we're bringing them on risk. And to mitigate these problems, we developed a blockchain um, protocol that allows you to trade without sending the funds. What we are doing is probably we 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 creating a kind of a proof of and post this proof reserve over to an exchange so that you can trade in this amount. And at the same time, we blocking the funds that you cannot moving the funds to somewhere else. Um, and by end of the day, if you are finished trading, you make an, so this was the functionality, um, what we built on blockchain, similar as it's uh, normally exists in the banking world with uh, traditional fiat on, on the accounts. From 
And this was a kind of a very um, complicated development. You have to dive very deep into the blockchain protocols to finding the angles, how you can do this as a security problem. You're working a lot with uh, SECs, um, with all the regulations and compliance. And it's a, it's a more like a legal framework as, as an IT framework by end of the day. But it gave me a lot of um, knowledge around uh, NFTs because, or well, let's say about the complete crypto law and how this is regulated in different countries uh, and how you can trade this. And this is um, something that we can participate on on the NFT because we understand how we can create NFTs uh, and where is the rights for it and where are the problems uh, where we need uh, regulation from, from an SEC or uh, yeah, something like this. So basically, there are two parts to this question. There's one, on one hand side, a lot of people care about privacy and data and users owning their data. So number one, can a user own their data more using this technology in some way? And number two, um, there is a lot of people don't like ads and find them intrusive. And there is an advertiser who pays for the ads and then the person who watches it gets some kind of service um, for free in return. Can I have the user who watches the ad paid or, or you know, not see the message, just see the headline and get paid directly or something like that, you know, because maybe as an example, if, if I'm in the market for a car, I assume that somebody would be willing to maybe spend $50 if he knows my preferences on showing me a Tesla ad. I don't know. So, so the, the, it's, it's around privacy. So I'm not quite clear with the question, but something like, like that. Uh, um, do you have a vision like about that for the future? Okay, um, overall, the blockchain is uh, pseudo anonymous means you don't be exposed by your name or with an ID or something like this. You're having a wallet and you can change your wallet anytime. You, you can move uh, the NFTs, the collectibles, uh, the Bitcoins, the US dollars. You just can move them from one wallet in another wallet and nobody really knows this wallet belongs to what for a person. So in this case, um, you are kind of safe with privacy data. No, nobody really knows who you are. That's, that's a positive thing. Um, the negative thing is, of course, uh, I can, as I mentioned before on, on the NFT, um, I can identify the people who own the specific NFT and I can do something like an airdrop uh, to every wallet who owns this NFT before. So I would be able to address a specific group of people with an NFT. Um, if they accept this airdrop, then of course uh, you, you could even uh, add an advertising message into, into this as an audio, for example, into this NFT that you get per airdrop and then you probably get spammed. Uh, the good thing is you can block this. You can whitelist addresses where you want to get something from. So in, in case of an NFT, I, I would uh, suggest to say you whitelist the creator, the artist, but you're not whitelisting everybody else. So it means if somebody else is sending you an airdrop, you just decline it. But if it's come from the artist, you would accept it. So you are in full control of this and you not really get annoyed with, with spams because it even not reach you. It's not like you have a spam folder somewhere. It just not reach you. This is a little bit nicer as a spam folder on the emails. Do you believe that many um, items in the future will be owned or the proof of ownership will be in an NFT? For instance, my phone, my guitar, my car, uh, uh, my house, I don't know. It probably depends uh, the, the value of, of the items. Um, I'm not so sure uh, about some of the items. 
like a guitar. Yeah, maybe if it's a, a rare one, if it's a spe special one. Uh, for a car, I can see use cases. So if you own this car, can can send the token to, or let's say, uh, you know, a token has a public part and a, and a private part. You are the owner of the token. This is your private part. But the, the public part, you probably can send to, to an insurance company and say, OK, yeah. I want in quotation. There is no discussion how old your car, whatever your car, everything is in the token. This is your car. It would be probably very easy for you to get something like this. And if you buy an insurance, you have your insurance on your smartphone. You have your insurance there as a token. Whatever has happened, everything is in one place. You think on, on your device. And what I see is this use cases for the future that we will have so many things on our smartphone. Um, yeah, this, this will really change our, our way, how we deal with things and how we work. And we can go into the next point. Let's say if you're getting one of the newer cars in future with an electronic key, you just can move the key to your friend. You just send it to your wallet and, and, he, and then he can drive your car if you're even not there. Maybe you're in America and he drives a car in Israel in this time. It would work. You just move the, the key over and you can limit the key. Let's say you have access only for 12 hours. After this, you cannot open the car anymore. There, there are so many options that, that are coming on, on this level. So I can see for many items, yes, we will have them on the smartphone. Fascinating. Yeah, I have not heard that example of the of the of the key of using a car. That's really cool. Like the ramifications, we haven't even started. It does. Yeah, I think I mean, there, are, there are many things coming. I have a smart lock where I can basically enable another phone number to uh, open the door, which uh, currently is not installed. And also, I'm not so sure how safe that is, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating what will come, and and it makes total sense. But would you could would you also be able to? You would probably also be able to transfer ownership of the car then, if you want. Of course, yes, you can transfer ownership. Uh, you could easily lend money with it, transfer it to the bank or something like this. Everything is much easier, and there is no no big needs of of another proof because you have access to it. You have access to the wallet. Wow. Right now, when you want to hire someone, so a typical process, I think for most, at least definitely in the high tech space is looking someone's profile on LinkedIn. Like before you'd look on Facebook, before you'd look on Twitter, before you'd look on YouTube, you would look on LinkedIn. What's your work history? Do you have reviews? This is like right now with like a standard procedure. How do you see blockchain slash NFTs uh, impacting uh, how hires are made? Also here, we will have the same things. I mean, um, the use case of the blockchain, immutable data, um, obviously you, you're having your work history, all the uh, letters from the school, all your scores, uh, all the letters from, from your uh, employers before, everything is on the blockchain. So it can be just, easy track and, and you have a proof that this really is the truth. If you're looking on, on LinkedIn in this days, you're not really sure if this person has this degree or not. Uh, wow, this is like, it's mind blowing. Uh, so, so basically, do I, do I get it correctly? If let's say universities start at some point having their degrees on, an, on a blockchain, then they just put it there yes. and that's it. You can't, yes, and, you and they start already. Uh, they start already. Ah, oh, who, who did? Do you do you, like? Uh... Uh, I cannot recall the name yet, but it is. Uh, I, I think it was some university will, will start to roll it out. Uh, all the new degrees are on the blockchain. Wow. What? Where other? In what other areas are you aware of uh, institutions or, or large corporations, uh, or, or even governments? Um, starting to roll out this technology? Um, I, I thought this, especially in, in big organizations, uh, to, to rolling out blockchain, 
on keeping track on, on inventory. Also keeping track on uh, fast moving goods, um, all, all this kind of uh, delivery services, supply chain, and uh, especially uh, another area is uh, organic uh, farming, or organic fishing. Uh, so we have some nice examples, uh, I think they're coming from IBM. Uh, you have the, the fisher in Indonesia, he, he pull up the fish. And if you're in America in the restaurant, you just scan the QR code and you can see, okay, this fish got catched, let's say three days before. It got transported like this, 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 this is a uh, complete uh, chain of the transportation. And you, you, you can trace everything. I mean, this, this is, a, is one of the main use cases of the blockchain is the traceability of whatever. And, and is it true that nobody can interfere with it, not even government? So basically, if I was a citizen of Germany and it, my citizenship would be on the blockchain, then nobody could make me disappear. Not, not saying anybody would, but... Um, yeah, I mean, the blockchain will never fall. It is not like an internet and I really looking forward to the first uh, processes on the last side. If people say, I want to remove my data from a blockchain, this will be uh, a mission impossible. So we will have a little bit fun on this because if I'm thinking about the discussions around Facebook to saying, oh, I don't want to, that this is shown and I want to delete this and so, uh, I think it's a few years ago as somebody uh, decide, uh, even in the internet, you have a right of forgotten. This is impossible with blockchain. And so we should be very careful what we put on the blockchain. Um, so maybe to building up a social media uh, is something critical on a blockchain on one hand, but other things like a newspaper would be very good on a blockchain so that we really have um, improved and don't uh, coming in the trap of like uh, the AI stuff where we're talking about deep fake. And deep fake only works if I don't have a proof. But if I have a blockchain who can prove the, uh, the, orig uh, or, uh, um, the original, then I'm sure that this is not a fake. And this would be very helpful for the future, especially uh, to fighting against deep fakes that's going, coming with the AI technology in the future. That was one of the things that Dave and I were speaking about with Noi um, in terms of uh, your own rights to your digital, your own digital persona, meaning your voice, your video. So let's say, you know, for example, you, you uh, down the line, Soji can do a deep fake of your voice. So like I send a, a message to David on Soji, but it sounds like Dirk, even though it's my message. So where does my voice actually uh, get get owned? How do, how do you see that with, with the deep fake um, technology? It will be especially complicated. Um, in this moment, if the deep fake is, is in place, it is hard to to get a proof against it, but there are ways to prove it. I mean, it is similar, like uh, you have in an AI, at least today, you have an AI, in an AI still pattern that you can match, like in DNS, you can see this is manipulated. The deep fakes are not perfect, not yet. So, but this is why I say it is so important to get the original on, on a blockchain to have to say, no, no, this is a fake. Here is the original. And everybody can, can listen to the original and know this is not changed. This is from the, from the blockchain and it is uh, immutable and, and absolutely decentralized. So nobody has control over it. You were one of the first people to be a digital nomad. Uh, you foresee blockchain and NFTs. What were you doing in the nineties? Um, you know, before, before I like, what, what were you into in the nineties? Because you seem someone who clearly understands where culture and trends and technology is headed. So before this like took over, I'm curious about what your technical interest and in activity in the nineties were. Oh yeah. Um, 
<laughs> long time ago. I really like every kind of technology. So I, I was uh, even six years old as I owned my first computer. It was a ZX81, a very nice machine. Um, and later on, as we don't have a network, and uh, as I'm coming from Germany, we're having uh, six weeks uh, summer holidays. I use this time with a friend and we're building a middle wave uh, transmitter to transporting data between two computers. Uh, it works, but of course it was illegal in Germany because you need a license for it. And this brought me to the point to make a ham radio license uh, to doing this kind of connecting legal. Um, yeah, this was the kind of technology where, where I was uh, in this. Very cool. David, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you ask, uh, I don't know if it's lightning round or last questions uh, that you want to ask Dirk. Um, I think we could probably go on for hours. Maybe we'll have another session, but really appreciate your time and your insights and your brilliance and your vision. Uh, yeah, honor, honored to have you on the team. David. Um, just basically, what are you most excited about technology-wise uh, in the coming, in the, let's say, near future? one to five years, even though we heard that uh, now the technology is moving so fast that that might not be a near future. Um, I'm exciting that we really can bring forward with talking to the systems. We will have more smart assistants. We will have more smart homes, more smart assistants. It will be so much easier for us to communicate. I mean, I, I, I think it was 1997 as I try uh, with natural dragon speaking and, and Windows software for, I think, Windows 3.11 or so, and then sound blaster card in full size uh, to give some easy commands to start a program on under Windows. It was very nice, but it works. Yeah, it works. So, and I really like this kind of technology. So we will see that this device is getting faster and better. I mean, from, from the last year, I made a very nice experiment uh, with myself. I had a MacBook and I bought an iPad. And the last 12 months, I shifted to use the iPad more as a MacBook. And this tells me that this iPad is really a replacement now for the MacBook. And we will see that we have so many more devices in future, like uh, smart watches, that will doing so much more functions that we probably don't have the need for a smartphone anymore. We might have somewhere in our pocket and, and let's say a bigger screen, but probably all the power and all the technology will be in your smartwatch and you just have somewhere in the pocket the screen to, to see it on a bigger size. These are things that I that I believe this will be coming in, in the near future, and we're wearing the things like like smart watches, smart rings, and this is a the way how even blockchain can help us to owning things, to getting things, taking things with us, uh, without having a lot of physical goods, and uh, this is also from an economical footprint. We be saving a lot of resources if we just collecting things digital and taking the things with us instead of printing and packing and shipping and all this kind of stuff. So I think here we have a very nice future in front of us where we really see nice things that, that we can have. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is. But what I really think is um, what was in the past with the NFTs in the last, let's say, six months is really more like in, like in gambling. Some people creating something, they try to sell it, and sometimes it works very, very good. They're getting a, a very big amount of money, and other things are not working well out. It's an experimental phase. But the real use case for Suchi or the real use case for, for NFT is Sochi. This is what coming now. We would giving 
NFTs and very, um, yeah, a, a volume. It's not only that you have five NFTs, 10 NFTs, or some artists make an NFT. We would here like a platform and be creating out of this platform the NFT, NFTs for so many artists and, and so many different styles of music, of art. This is something where we really would say we, we will be NFT. And, and why, why is that so unique to Soji that's unable to be done on other platforms right now? This is a community. The artist community that Soji is built in, in the background. These artists are getting the option to, to record in Soji and to create the art and to just press a button and have an NFT. And this is does not exist in this day. Yeah, and, and as mentioned before, I mean, videos are not the perfect use case for NFTs. Audios are. Audio is a real perfect use case for it. And why is audio a perfect use case for NFT versus text versus video versus like, you know, the, the first NBA top shot type of thing? Um, it is about the size of, of the space that, that you have in any uh, NF, NFT. You cannot store so much data. And, and this is exactly the point to say uh, a short video seconds or so, this works well. But longer term videos, that doesn't work. So I think the big problem what we see in, in the crypto market at the moment is the Bitcoin goes probably to a bear market now. So the Bitcoin prices drops, uh, people getting a little bit disinterested on the blockchain, on the Bitcoins. Um, and the NFT is totally different. The NFT is, is a unique value. You artist, you, you buy the music, whatever you want to list. We are not depending on, on the price prediction of Bitcoin. We're not depending on a hype if Bitcoin goes down. We are totally out of these problems. The Sochi, we, we just using the NFT in the core and the value of the blockchain idea and creating the value on it. And this makes Sochi so different for blockchain, for, for NFTs, as all the other projects outside. The other projects are growing and, and falling uh, at the same time with the big currencies like Ethereum or Bitcoin. But we can just be stable and creating the value for the artist and we will be, have a platform where people just buy and collect and supporting the artists and yeah, we're we, we bringing value to, to, an, to an concept that exists on the paper but is not really used yet. The use cases before was just trial and error, just some experimental things. So Soji is an ideal NFT use case. Yeah. It's very exciting. Would um, an imaging, like a stock image service also be in a near ideal use case? Is the, it be an ideal, the fact that you can license it and put it uh, and it's small enough to fit on the blockchain? Um, theoretically, yes, but the audience is not exist. You have a lot of, um, let's say, a fan base on, on, on audio, but there is not so much fan base on, on stock photos. I see. Yes. Is this really the cool that comes together the community that is built the people who listen and the artists on one place with the option to create the nft this makes it an outstanding product genius i'm happy you explained it to us <laughs> to me anyways <laughs> but no it, I mean, it was kind of like it was kind of obvious we have to do something like that but it's this is like really condensed in in one, two sentences, because, you know, it makes total sense. Like, I can't remember the last time a famous photographer filled stadiums, you know, with raving fans. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and as I say, I, I really think this this way, um, I mean, you're coming up in Sochi with the idea to giving the, the money to the artists. So, and, and this was one of the things that, that I read on, 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 the, on LinkedIn, where I really say, okay, that's the point. You, you can do something on it. I guess it's down to two. Yeah, okay, we can do this, no problem. <laughs> no, but I, I, I really, I mean, this was really something I was thinking cool. So it means you're collecting money and you want to share it back to the people. The blockchain is the perfect tool to count this, to make this traceable, to make this trustworthy for everyone. Nobody uh, feel has any bad feeling, there's no smelling it. No. It's so much cleaner with the blockchain. And then the option is really to say, okay, we're creating art. Yes. And, and with this art, I mean, probably not every audio will be art. So some of the audios just stay in Sochi will be never been NFT. Yes. I, I also, I particularly like that it just, it looks like everything is organically uh, growing in a sense though there was like first people recorded songs and then they, first they just played them live then they recorded songs then they uh, distributed them and then the people started copying them so there were laws introduced to prevent that and then there were uh, agencies created to track it and enforce it and so all of this stuff basically if you really think of it you know artist consumer it doesn't make any sense it's like in today's world you wouldn't create it like that so so that's yeah. what i really like about it the first principles of soji are really sound yeah and then all the, the other format that i really can think you know, like you make you make something and say okay i, I produce only 999 uh, nfts from it so you you get a, a rare one yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you get you you creating really collectibles. No, you you can add uh, spe specific things to it. Uh, I, I can give you a backstage pass, and uh, as an artist, and I, I I recording a special welcome message to you. This make it this little part of audio will be part of of your NFT and make it very special and has a has a value. And this is what I say, so this, this kind of tokens are not interchangeable because every token is unique. So it's, How do the issuers to the Bitcoin? Tokens. How do the issuers of, uh, um, I mean, Bitcoin is just mined by everybody, right? So, but if we basically have the white paper and then who creates the blockchain and who, who mines the uh, tokens and how does it work? Um, this depends a little bit on on the decision that we're doing for the platform. Um, we probably will not create our own um, blockchain network, so we will, we will use an existing network. Um, there are many different uh, uh, Stellar, Ripple. There are a lot of big ones, and you have there a community who are creating the tokens, who are mining the tokens. And uh, we're just going out there and say, okay, we need, uh, let's say we need 999 NFTs. They mint this for this artist and they're getting also some of the royalties. So some of the money goes to this platform in form of the fees. If we, we, if we transfer an NFT from one wallet to another, you have to pay a fee. And this fee goes to the people who, who, who mint the tokens and, and so on. Mm. But the so beauty is, I mean. Transfer. Okay, and, and what, what are those fees? How high are those fees in terms of percentage? Are those percentages or are they fixed fees? Or? Uh, these are percentages, but they are probably very low. And uh, it also depends again a little bit how we set it up uh, how for a, a private network with an probably kind of an 
mainstay concept so that we not need to verify every transaction. So we could, let's say, bundle 10 transactions and verify 10, just one time, so only one time fee for 10 transactions. Um, it depends a little bit also of how much traffic we have and what for a network we really go with. And uh, I'm, I'm looking into this once the white papers are done. I will search for, for the right one that really fits to our needs. And this is also, let's say, stable enough to be existing in, in three years, in five years. So there is, we learned this out of the past in 2017, 18. Uh, some of these networks was very hyped, they're coming up and they even not exist in these days anymore. So we need to be careful to, to, to decide for technology that really works for long term. And is there um, something built in where we as the provider of the service basically connecting and doing it for them? Because the idea is that they don't for the end user it's very simple right i envision like a future where they just open the app and they have like a screen with even their reporting and we read it out of the blockchain and show it to them yeah. so is there a way that um for for the service i mean we could charge the user or we could participate in the nfts or both right um, and how, how will that be how would you see that uh, in terms of being fair, transparent, and also, of course, paying for, for the, the cost of it and, and helping so to grow. Okay, I mean, the, the, the network fees need, need to be paid to, to the network provider. And the network provider will share the money with the miners and every other instance on the network. So we, we don't have any influence on this. Um, and fees only coming on the transaction level. So if we transfer something or if we create something. So if you create the NFT at the first time, there will be the first time fee, so the minting fee, and then you have the transaction fees later on. Um, yeah, as I say, about the high of, the, of this fees, we don't have really influence on it, um, but we should only do this for real NFTs. So means um, maybe we, we should limit this to pro users also uh, who can mint NFTs. I mean, it doesn't make sense uh, that every uh, uh, voice recording that I make uh, will be automatic in NFT. So it's, it should be stay on, on Fuji, but it should not stay on an NFT. So this should be um, everybody able to do it. And it's, it's easy, yeah, but um, we should really see that we only use this for, for artwork and, and not for daily things. I have a crazy idea, but first I want to know, Ari, is everything all right? Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, for context, I, I've been, uh, I put my phone on in the deck and uh and every investor meeting so i so i got three phone calls i was like well maybe it's an investor who's calling me but anyways nothing important it was not an investor it was also not an emergency so that's good i yeah. was a bit worried because yeah. um, so here's the crazy idea no it's, it's too crazy but Go. it seems like the world moves to complete transparency right <clears throat> so we can either we can basically talk about how the networks we use preserve our privacy, or we can say everything I say from now on is public. <laughs> so my, my point being, it could be default public. I mean, who's gonna listen to that anyways? <laughs> like I'd be willing to have all my conversations public. Like I don't even remember the last, time I said something that couldn't be public. I mean, there's maybe something where I made a bad joke, you know, uh, to actually yesterday on the phone call, I made like a bad joke, uh, uh, a little bit sexist joke to a friend musician. Um, but if it would be out there, it would be out there, you know. But I think it's too radical, like people are really concerned with their privacy. But I, I kind of like the idea in some sense. 
I mean, it's in in Sochi, you, you just can have it on the fingertip. If you want, make an NFT from it. Then it's public forever. You cannot delete it. And have you read Principles by Ray Dalio and uh... No. Have you, Ari? Principles? Uh, overview. Overview. So basically, uh, Ray Dalio, like uh, in, in invented institutional investing in the US, right? It's like the, one of the biggest funds. So he um, has, I think it's called Bridgewater. So in his organization, every conversation is recorded and archived and public inside the organization to anyone. There's complete transparency in the organization. Look, you can, every piece of information you want to look up, if I want to see what Dirk Bauer spoke with, uh, you know, Adi on the phone, I can actually listen to it. So, and he says, nobody goes and listens to it, but it just creates this atmosphere. It's just, this is kind of like stuck in my head, but mm -hmm. I think it's not very helpful probably now. I'm just, I just find it an interesting thought. Do you want to wrap up uh, uh, or have more questions or, um, because we are already timing out again. I, th I think we're good for now. Uh, there's a lot there. Uh, Dirk, really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate you um, and really excited that you're part of Soji. I mean, now it's, it's a whole different ball game. And um, yeah, we're, we're like inches away from, from taking this to the moon. It's pretty exciting. All right, until next. Yeah, I like it. All right. Thanks for coming out. Future talk. Yeah. <laughs>